uh, the, the uh, committee hearing will come to order. Uh, this is the uh, Transportation Policy and Finance Committee. Uh, it is April 30th, 2001, and there are two bills up uh, this morning on an informational basis only. That would be Senator Pratt's bill, Senate file 2375, and Senator Begum's bill, uh, Senate file 2199. Uh, I think the way we're going to proceed this morning, members, is uh, we'll have Senator Pratt present his bill uh, with his testifiers first. We'll then go to Senator Bingham with her testifiers, uh, or her presentation, I should say, and uh, uh, the one testifier that has signed up on Senator Bingham's bill. Uh, then we do have the agencies, uh, MnDOT and Met Council. Uh, who would uh, follow up and and I think just for ease, uh, we'll have both uh, we'll have both agencies talk about both bills at the same time, and then hopefully there'll be some time left over that members can ask some questions. Uh, so that is sort of the uh, outline of the procedure for uh, this morning. Uh, and so we will then begin with uh, Senator Pratt. Welcome to the Transportation uh, Committee, Senator Pratt. Please identify yourself for the record and proceed with your bill. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and, and committee members. Uh, Eric Pratt, and I represent Senate District 55, which is Scott County. Uh, and Mr. Chair, we are served by Minnesota Valley Transit Authority. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senate File 2375, uh, in my mind, is a, is a bill that uh, relieves Met Council from what I believe to be a conflict of interest. It moves the suburban transit providers under the oversight of the Department of Transportation, much like uh, Greater Minnesota Transit is, because the Metropolitan Council has an inherent conflict by being both the planning organization and the operator of Metro Transit. And so uh, what we find often is, is a conflict between the organizations uh, that quite honestly, Met Council gets to decide in many cases in their own favor. And so we believe that uh, it'd be more appropriate uh, to have that oversight done by, uh, uh, by the Department of Transportation. And Mr. Chair, that's, you know, that's my simple explanation. And maybe if I could have Ms. Stengel uh, walk through the bill itself uh, because it's it's a little more technical than I think I can explain effectively. Thank you, Senator uh, Pratt. Uh, Ms. Stengel, could you walk us through the bill, please? Yes, Mr. Chair and members. Um, and as Senator Pratt indicated, it is a pretty detailed process, and I won't try to get too far into the weeds. Um, and I'll preface my comments by saying this is largely taking the replacement service program right now that's in Chapter 473 under the Met Council and moving it into one of MnDOT's chapters. So the statute is largely the same in its details as it's currently operated. It's just sort of shifting who will be doing um, the calculations and the providing the assistance. So briefly through the bill, uh, the first section makes some changes to the Greater Minnesota Transit account to allow use out of that account for the replacement service provider assistance program. Uh, section two deletes a cross-reference to um, the current replacement service program statute that's being repealed. Section three is really the meat of the bill. And this is the section that talks about the replacement service program. Um, it talks about, uh, it, it establishes the program within MnDOT and continues it. Uh, it's sort of a continuation of the current program. So, you know, we're not reestablishing anything. We're just shifting it. Um, it talks about the eligibility uh, requirements, which remain the same. Essentially, uh, you are within the Metro Area Transit Taxing District and have limited or no service by Met Council um, and meet several other requirements that are set forth. Uh, it explains how you apply for assistance. It provides the um, financial assistance formula, um, which is uh, a series of factors determining what your assistance amount will be. Um, it allows uh, uh, cities and towns that receive assistance through this program to also receive assistance from the Metropolitan Council in some situations, and then allows cities and towns that are eligible for assistance under this program 
um, to levy a tax to pay for the obligations related to transit and other activities. Section four amends how money is deposited into the metro area transit account. So it decreases that amount and then has a corresponding increase in the Minnesota transit account and that ties back to section one. The current statute is repealed and then this all becomes effective July 1st, 2021. That conclude the uh, the overview, Ms. Stengel? Yes, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Stengel. Uh, Senator Pratt, uh, any comments before I go to your uh, witnesses? Uh, no, Mr. Chair, thank you, appreciate it, but uh, I'd rather have the witnesses uh, explain it from their perspective. Thank you, Senator Pratt. The first testifier we have up is Mr. Wong uh, from the Chaska City Council. Mr. Wong, if you would identify yourself for the record, and proceed with your testimony. Yes, uh, thank you, Ms. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm, my name is Mike Wong, and I'm a council member with the city of Shaska. Um, in addition, I'm also the chair of the Southwest Transit Commission and vice chair of the Suburban Transit Association. Um, do we have the the deck on display here, or how does? There you go. Yes, you are up on display. Go ahead. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. So before I begin, um, I'd like to start off by setting the stage that this bill is just a starting point for the conversation of moving suburban transit providers under MnDOT. There are a number of issues still to be flushed out and vetted with, and discussed with various parties. Undoubtedly, there are issues that we haven't even considered at this time. As this is just a conversation starter and not a final product, we'd like you to be aware of like three key areas that are not addressed in the bill that currently stands. Uh, capital funding sources, bus titles and ownership, and issues around metro mobility. I'd like to thank you. So if we go to the next slide. Oh, sorry, go, oh, sorry, back one, right just off a slide here. So I'd like to uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify um, for um, SF number 2375. Uh, we'd like to start off with a problem statement that this bill addresses. Um, one that is identified not just by us, but by others. In this case, the Federal Transit Administration and also the legislative auditor. And it reads, the Metro Council, Met, uh, Metro Transit operates, Metro Transit, Metro Mobility, and the Metropolitan Council Transit Operations, while also responsible for regional transit planning, transit administration, and transit operating and capital funding. This arrangement provides an unavoidable advantage to the transit operations operating controlled by the Metropolitan Council. So at its core, the issue being addressed by this legislation is that each of the suburban transit providers is competing with Metro Transit, Metro Mobility, and Met Council uh, transit operations for funding, administrative support, and fair oversight from Met Council, which is their parent organization. And in some cases, the same people. For example, Ramvest, the regionally allocated motor vehicle sales tax, is discretionary at the behest of Met Council, who is also obligated to fund their own transit services. However, under MnDOT, we would not be fighting for the same funding from within the same organization, which is also responsible for delivering their own services. So to use a different analogy, this is like working somewhere and trying to get fair treatment when your peer is also the boss's kid. Next slide, please. So let's take a step back in time and talk a little bit about how we got here today. So before ST formed in the 1970s and 1980s, communities received transit funding through property taxes. These taxes went through a process where they were distributed and transit routes were planned based on needs that didn't necessarily reflect those of the community, communities which were being served. For example, Chaskin and Chanhassen only received a handful of buses a day for the property taxes gathered in those areas. This was really quite simply unacceptable to community members at the time. So because of this, the communities opted to form their own transit agencies, which they knew then what they know today, that the best people to serve our communities and are those who have a deep understanding of our culture, our people and our needs, those who are closest to the communities. Next slide, please. So because we understand those needs so deeply, we also have the ability to innovate and to directly address those needs. 
In fact, the Blue Ribbon Commission, as well as the legislative auditor, commended suburban transit agencies for their innovation and highlighted pilot tests of new approaches and technologies. Whether it was innovation of coach buses for express commuters, micro transit services, think of them as a uh, public transit version of Uber or Lyft, or special services to Twins and Vikings games, or dedicated state fair buses, our agencies have always put the needs of our communities first. This, in fact, reflects the it is reflected by the incredibly high, which is over 95% customer satisfaction rates from our riders. And this isn't just one of our agencies. Yet we're providing reliable, affordable, cost-effective, high quality service to our communities, in spite of the fact that suburban communities are contributing more than 10% to MVEST, to the MVEST funding formula, while only receiving back only under 4% of the net contribution, a discrepancy of that 6% there. Next slide, please. The Suburban Transit, Suburban Transit Association supports a governance shift to the, to the Office of Transit for a simple reason, that MnDOT does not directly operate or provide transit services. Because they're not a transit operator, they're inclusive of the transit pro providers under their purview. We believe that a move under the Office of Transit would allow greater collaboration between ourselves and other transit agencies, a similar size within the state. Um, so let me just hand this over to uh, Luther here and we'll continue. Thank, thank you, Mr. Wong. Uh, Mr. Widener, are you here? Uh, the, the, uh, uh, I don't see you yet. Um, but I am assuming that you are here, Mr. Widener, if you would identify yourself uh, and proceed with your testimony. And just so you know, your uh, your uh, slideshow, your your PowerPoint is still up. So, uh, Mr. Widener, I don't see you, but are you there? He's muted. He's there, but he's muted. Mr. Widener, you are muted apparently, and I'm still not seeing him. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. There you are. Welcome I'm, to the committee, Mr. Widener. Sorry about that, Mr. Chair and committee. It's a little difficult when you're operating the slideshow and trying to unmute yourself at the same time. Good morning, and thank you for, and thank you for your time. I'll pick up, um, and I first wanna start off just- Before you start, Mr. Widener, please just for the record, identify yeah. yourself and, and uh, with whom you are associated and then proceed, just for the record. My apologies. Luther Winder, Chief Executive Officer for Minnesota Valley Transit Authority. Good morning um, and thank you, Mr. Chair and Committee. I'd like to start off to talk about the unintended design conflicts. It's important to understand that things were, when we look at design, when we look at concepts, some things over time um, even though they're well-intended and well-meaning, as you see them in the space, as you see them obviously in functionality, as you see them in the environment, you start to see obviously some flaws and you may actually start to see some things that need to be corrected. That's one of the things that we intend and see now with this current iteration in regards to suburban transit under Metropolitan Council. And we'll, I'll talk through that in a little bit. It's important to understand that the Metropolitan Council as our MPO has a responsibility, not only to the region, but also to the Federal Transit Administration to provide what we like to call a 3C planning approach, which is continuous, cooperative, and comprehensive. I think we'll all understand that some of the echoes and some of the statements that, that we're echoing, we've probably heard in the space and communicated about from also some of our, our um, neighboring counties as well. But it's important to look at this in the context of this. Is it the will of the council not to provide this level of planning and this vision, or is it by a design? And I don't believe it's a will. I believe it's simply by the design. And I think that if we look to modify that design, we can actually look to obviously change and get a more regional and more statewide and more comprehensive vision. And I think we'll see that as we go through this, hopefully as I continue through this PowerPoint. The Met Council, as we talked about, operates those other three modes. And it's very unique in that standpoint that only one other organization um, in the country has something a little similar, and that would be in Portland. This does continue to provide a conflict of interest 
um, and conflict responsibilities involving transit operations operated by the council. FTA and federal guidelines call upon public transportation providers and oversight agencies to engage in well-organized, inclusive transportation planning to help the region meet current needs while preparing for future challenges. Before I move, it's important to understand that the thing about transit is this. Transit is one of the few public services that everyone can take advantage of, and most people do. So a person can be in a seat that's a millionaire right beside someone who doesn't have a home going to going downtown for various events. Do we plan just for the millionaire or do we also look at our training, our planning and our conference approach for that for that other gentleman or the other person of little means? We plan and we look at comprehensively to include everyone. So it shouldn't matter how many rides you provide. It should matter about what the vision is and how we take all these voices as a collective and put out the best product. But when you exclude certain voices in the planning process, you actually, you don't come up with a sound product. And obviously you're gonna have some flaws regionally as well as statewide. So it's important to note that the Federal Transit Administration um, came in and did um, a review of the Transportation Management Area of Planning Certification Review. This was just released last month on March 19th, and they identified some weaknesses um, with, with the Met Council and their MPO as far as their oversight and their planning related to suburban providers. One means the council does not have a written agreement identifying responsibilities in carrying out metropolitan planning process with transit providers. Two, the Met Council must improve coordination with all transit providers and the transportation improvement plan financial plan does not provide process for determining allocation of federal funds among area transit providers. Because of this unintended design conflict, suburban transit providers have been left out of regional planning efforts and are at most only given stakeholder roles in planning studies. The suburban providers priority services such as micro transit and commuter services are not mentioned in Met Council's current long range plans. What I ask all of these members, I'll ask all members today is to go look at the Metropolitan Council website and see if they can find anything about Minnesota Valley or any of the other three other suburban providers on their website. I'd like, I challenge you to take a look at even some of the speeches that are given by some of, by some of the council representatives that include anything related to suburban providers. It's important to understand that transit should not be an island. We should not be an island off to a side. There needs to be inclusion in our suburban, in the suburban needs in order to strengthen the whole region as well as the state. The solicitation, as an example, the solicitation process um, lacks a guarantee for suburban providers to receive federal transit funding. For example, non-BRT projects compete for as little as $8 million, while BRT projects receive around $32 million each cycle, including $25 million set aside. It's important to note, we don't, we don't disagree or have any issues with BRT. We don't disagree or have any issues necessarily with light rail. What we have, what we, what we take exception to is that micro transit express service in our, in our innovation that we want to actually continue to push in our region and our service there that connect our customers to the region are not given a fair, are not given a fair, um, fair process for us to submit these projects to get funding. This is the way that we all expand our services. But if the board is skewed in a way where the metrics skewed towards the core or towards the person um, making the rules, um, it kind of leads everyone out. And that's what we've seen at Foot Suburban Providers that we don't necessarily see um, with some of our greater Minnesota, like we don't see with our greater Minnesota counterparts. Equity by right sizing. It's important to note that one of the things I want everyone to kind of understand as I, as I close out and turn it back over to Mike is that suburban providers are very similar in size as well as in services offered by our counterparts around the state. We're all bus operators. We're all looking, we're all, all innovators. It's important to understand Duluth Transit Authority was one of the first, it was the first in the state to, um, to have electrification of, of vehicles. There's no comprehensive plan or communication from the council in any way to include suburban providers in our, in our, in our quest to, um, to add electrification to our fleets. As we look at space, how we look at our metrics, whether it be congestion mitigation, that is not incorporated in any plans or any, or any scoring process to give us additional funding we need to take the congestion off these highways and roads as we see ourselves opening back up. It's an also important to note that some of the messaging that we see come from the council directly contradicts what our customers are saying. 
we know Minneapolis is coming back. We know our customers based on a survey, over 90% of our customer survey MVAT said that when their business opened back up, they are going to get back on express service and to go back downtown, especially with these gas prices, as we see, and the parking costs. So we, we, but we hear themes that that not, not necessarily be the case. This is why a comprehensive approach is needed. And we may need to look at right-sizing where our office, where we're put under to an office that deals simply with bus operations, that they also do not operate bus service. I will turn this back over to Mike to close out. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Wong. Uh, if uh, you uh, could just kind of wrap it up so that uh, uh, I want to try and save some time for members to ask questions when we're done. Mr. Okay. Wong. I'll try to get through this as quick as we can here. Um, so in short, the, you know, we believe that being under the Office of Transit will offer greater collaboration between ourselves and other transit agencies of similar size within the state. Now, this could include statewide planning, procurement processes, which will benefit not only suburban providers, but those outstate through greater purchasing power and sharing of knowledge, experience, and our abilities to innovate. So overall, we believe we have increased engagement with our peers and support for this clear, more efficient administration of policy and funding. Next slide, please. So fundamentally, we believe that the suburbs such as Egan, Chaska, Chanhassen, Eden Prairie, and Burnsville should have that same level of involvement in transit planning direction and management and operations as similar sized agencies like in the Mankato, Rochester, St. Cloud, and Duluth. And we believe the benefits to each of these agencies' member communities, um, we believe this will benefit all their communities by ensuring stable funding and community-engaged planning and operations and decision-making that's empowered closer to the people who are being served. After all, who better to serve our communities than those who are closest to them? So here's a list of contacts. And at the end of this presentation in the deck here, you'll find citations for the Federal Transit Association, our administration, the Governor's Blue Ribbon Committee, auditor reflecting these same points. So we've also included the FTA's 2020 TMA certification review findings, which will also reflect these points from an outside perspective. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee for your time and the opportunity to present today. Thank you, Mr. Wong. Uh, Senator Pratt, any final uh, words before we go to Senator Bingham? Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I, why don't we just go to questions and then uh, I can close it up after that. Uh, we are going to, uh, uh, Senator Pratt, we're gonna do Senator Bingham's uh, presentation, then we're gonna go to the agencies and then we're gonna go to questions. Got it, okay. Okay. Uh, do you want to do you want to wait for? Uh, well, Mr. Uh, Chair, maybe maybe just a, a couple of comments. I think you've you've heard ahead. the. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members. I think you've heard the the concern. Uh, I, uh, Mr. Winder and Mr. Wong, I think did a good job of laying out the conflict of interest. This is not a new function for the Department of Transportation, and you know I would just say that you know, uh, Mr. Winder and and. Uh, the suburban transit is where we've been driving for suburb to suburb uh, demonstration projects. And we have one that's very successful, not only bringing people to Shakopee for jobs, but uh, allowing people in Shakopee to get to jobs in Hennepin County. And so uh, I think we have to look at this as a very valuable service and uh, one that needs to be able to compete fairly. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Pratt, and, and I would encourage you, Senator Pratt, to uh, you know keep the discussion going. Uh, and uh, if you think that uh, in the interim, uh, the Transportation Committee can be of any of us any assistance to you, uh, please please let us know, and uh, sort of uh, uh, you know keep us in the loop as you progress with your discussions. So thank you, Senator Pratt. Uh, next on the agenda is. Um, uh, Senator Bingham's uh, file, Senate file 2199. Uh, there you are, Senator Bingham. Welcome to the committee. Thank uh, you, Mr. Chair. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first, I have to say that uh, Senator Pratt has a great bill there. Fascinating discussions on, on the suburban opt-outs. And I think, uh, Mr. Chair, hopefully at some point, we'll have a broader discussion about the subsidies related to those too. Um, but that's not uh, what this bill is about. 
So uh, thank you for holding an informational hearing, Mr. Chair and committee members on Senate file 2199. I want to take a moment and thank Senator Duckworth, uh, who's a co-author on this bill. Uh, we are introducing the bill in hopes to start a conversation, much like Senator Pratt's mm -hmm. before us, um, to respond to concerns uh, that we have heard from, from counties within our district and metro area. And um, I don't think there's a member on the committee that doesn't know how near and dear uh, and important I feel my county partners are. Um, basically, this bill separates the responsibility for transportation and transit planning and funding uh, in the Twin City metropolitan area from the operation and capital maintenance of those systems. So there, there's a variety of ways that this can be done, but this proposal shifts um, that authority um, for the planning and construction and implementation um, from the Met Council to um, a new Metropolitan Transit Planning Board housed within the Department of Transportation. So similar to um, Senator Pratt's proposal about um, a conflict of interest, but mine um, kind of dives a little bit deeper into, into um, why, and I'm gonna get that, to that in a second. Um, but we, we all have a, a common, the, the regions do it differently as again, what Senator Pratt um, ex bill explained, but we all have in common the separation of power that we are, are lacking here in the Twin Cities transit system. And I'm hoping that if we separate these, um, that it will give greater transparency, accountability, and ultimately um, decision-making in the planning, funding, maintenance, and operation of our regional transit system. Um, you know, Mr. Chair, I'm gonna just take a moment to kind of talk about uh, why, why, you know, more, more importantly, like, why do why would we want to do this like right at this moment? One, um, we need to invest in our transit system, and and um, you know it's been difficult. It's been partisan, but it's been difficult. And our we need to make a system that's efficient and dependable and reliable. And our economic viability and our economic development of the whole state, to be honest, depends on that strong system. And, you know, Met Council put forward some, some language that's in your bill, and I'm on the Transportation Conference Committee, and I can't wait. I'm gonna have a good time on that, Mr. Chair, can't wait. And I know there's a couple others on this committee that are on it. That's problematic for counties. You know, those that don't know this, I'm, I was on CTIB. I don't need to explain what that is for those on this committee, and I'm a signatory on the dissolution of it. You know, we can't keep pushing this responsibility onto counties. And Met Council proposed to do that. And they don't have the financial capacity to, to handle that. And, and it's not fair and it's paralyzing our ability to really look at the long-term maintenance operation and growth of the system. And we know that the the um, blue line, green line, and and southwest will be probably the only LRT that we have. Yeah, we can talk about no, and I hope we have some cool streetcars. My grandma always talked about the streetcars back in the day, going down Rice um, Rice Street. So we can have that discussion, but this is mainly going to be BRT from here on out, and regular route bus, and express route. And that's on roads and bridges, existing highways, bridges, and roads. That's MINDA, Mr. Chair and members. That's MINDA. That's not Met Council. And so I, the Met Council's relationship with counties is strained, and it's 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 damaged, quite honestly, because of the lack of of under the current governance. Um, I think there's a, 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 a lack of on, on both the House and the Senate, Democrats, Republicans, to really invest in it under its current governance. Um, and so it's just a strained relationship, but MnDOT has an exceptional relationship with our counties. And more importantly, they do a fantastic job in transit in rural Minnesota. So, I, I, I really just hope that this starts a conversation and, and I will point out 
that I introduced the bill in, in this Senate file 2199 that removes a major portion of what Met Council does. They haven't even reached out to me to say that they have a concern about it because I guarantee you they probably do. You know who did? Maybe not. <laughs> and I know they're on here. So it just kind of goes to that. Um, but, but Mr. Chair, I don't know if this is the answer. Maybe having a separate office is. But I can tell you that, that we need to do something. We need to, to invest. Um, and again, partnering off of what Senator Pratt said, we need to separate the conflict of interest. We need to kind of depoliticize, depardon, uh, uh, make this nonpartisan, invest in our, our transit system um, so that it has the viability to move people, to, to create jobs, to be safe, to help the environment. We can do all of that stuff. Um, Mr. Chair, and I hope that that this bill 2199 that separates the building implementation planning of transit in the metro area from um, putting that into MnDOT, separating it um, from that council, letting them do the operations, at least as part of that discussion um, that we can have today, um, but also in the uh, ongoing uh, week. So thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Bingham. Uh, we have uh, Patricia Nauman uh, signed up to uh, to testify. Uh, welcome, Ms. Nauman. If you'd, for the record, uh, uh, state your name with whom you are uh, associated with and uh, then proceed with your testimony. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, thank you uh, very much uh, for the opportunity to comment today. My name is Patricia Nauman and I am the executive director of the Association of Metropolitan Municipalities, or as we're known uh, frequently now as uh, Metro Cities. Uh, Metro Cities represents cities at both the legislature and the Metropolitan Council. And in fact, the association was created roughly concurrent with the creation of the Metropolitan Council in part to allow for the interests of city governments in the metro area to be represented in regional decision-making. This is important due to the close nexus of regional funding and policy in the implementation of those policies that is performed by the local governments in the region. Certainly, I appreciate uh, Senator Bigham's interest. She and I have had many conversations on the Metropolitan Council over the years, and I um, certainly appreciate that and her interest in the um, need for transparency and accountability uh, for regional systems, including transportation. I will just offer a little bit of perspective. If I could, I'll be very brief. Um, for a little bit of additional background, Metro City's legislative policies do address <clears throat> the scope of the policy making and activities of the Metropolitan Council, and they do speak to the need for an effective and cost efficient provision of regional infrastructure. So in other words, the four regional systems, as well as strong cooperation between the Metropolitan Council and local governments on the provision of those systems and the planning for those systems. Um, as I meant, um, mentioned the planning and provision of regional infrastructure does have a close nexus to the work of metropolitan city governments in particular. And for this reason, cities do consider themselves to be a primary constituency of the Metropolitan Council. The council is of course also partly funded by property taxes that are raised by all jurisdictions in the region. For these reasons, <clears throat> Metro Cities does wish to raise some concerns. Certainly we appreciate the discussion on this bill and of these issues in general. I would just raise the concern that a uh, transfer of responsibility of policy and funding for one of the four regional systems from a regional level agency to a state agency, uh, which has, you know, by, by its purpose is, is statewide rather than regional, uh, would have potential uncertain and potentially negative implications for the coordination of those systems at the regional level. And my con the concern is that it would remove a level of regional accountability and also potentially compromise the ability for local officials to have an adequate voice on regional decisions. Metro Cities does appreciate the inclusion in Senator Bingham's bill on the provision that it allows local officials to be appointed to the Metropolitan Planning Board um, by their peers. However, um, again, we do remain concerned that the transfer of authority in the bill could interfere with sort of the regional level planning and accountability that is done in close coordination with local governments across the spectrum of all regional systems. And also um, further could create some uncertainty on the status of the region's, uh, metropol the region's uh, MPO status, its Metropolitan Planning Organization status, and thus on the ability of the region then and its local governments to access federal transportation funds, which is the role that the, the TAB plays now and I think probably is intended with the Metropolitan Planning Board. 
Uh, thank you for the opportunity to come and I'll be very brief and I'll be happy to stand for any questions, Mr. Chair and members. Thank you, Ms. Nauman, uh, I appreciate it. Uh, Senator Bigham, uh, it would be my intention to go to the two state agencies at this point, both MnDOT and Met Council. If you've got any uh, uh, wanted, Mr. closing Chair, comments, uh, I'm, I'm gonna try to come back to both you and uh, Senator Pratt at the very end, but if you wanna make some comments now, go ahead. Oh yeah, I just wanted to say to um, Ms. Nauman, um, absolutely. Um, uh, I understand that concern. If this would move forward or some iteration of it would, um, you you know that local governments would have a, a, a seat at that table. Um, but more importantly, um, yeah, that MPO is huge and that's why it's in there. And so that's why I would rely on the expertise of this committee and others uh, in the committee process if this would move forward to kind of um, smooth that out. But yes, that's definitely um, front of mind. Thank you, Senator Bingham. Uh, and now members, I'm gonna to go to the two state agencies, both MnDOT and Met Council. Uh, we'll begin with MnDOT. Uh, and I have uh, Victoria Nill and John Dukic uh, on to testify. The first one on my list is Victoria Nill, but you can go in, in uh, any uh, order you wish, but I'll recognize Ms. Nill at this point. Good morning, Senator Newman and committee members. Um, my name is Victoria Nill, and I'm with MnDOT's Office of Transit and Active Transportation. Uh, MnDOT does have some concerns about Senate File 2375. It would require MnDOT to become responsible for administering operating grants for the metro area replacement transit system providers. Currently, MnDOT administers the Greater Minnesota Transit Account that is set up to assist the transit systems outside the metro area. Expanding the MnDOT Transit Program to transit systems within the area is in conflict with the intent of the Greater Minnesota Transit Program. This bill would result in having the replacement system providers receiving federal funds through Met Council and then state funds through MnDOT, which would make for a very challenging and very inefficient program to manage. Currently, um, per state statute, MnDOT is capped at 416,000 of state funds to administer the Greater Minnesota Transit Program. This cap is already inadequate and leaves no ability for me to administer any additional funds. If the replacement service providers were to be incorporated into Greater Minnesota Transit Program, there's a possibility that they would ultimately compete with Greater Minnesota Transit Systems for the finite resources and administrative support. Given that the potential ridership is much greater in the metro area, this could be a detriment to our most rural systems. The Metro Area Replacement Service Providers have an established relationship with the Met Council. It would be inefficient to break off this piece of the Metro program and add it to the Greater Minnesota program. The Metro Cities already have an established relationship and cl work closely with the Met Council. The Met Council and the Cities are familiar with the needs of the constituents in those areas as MnDOT is familiar with the needs of Greater Minnesota. Each program has a separate mission and differ in the main types of transit services provided. The nature and service in the suburban communities in the metropolitan area and the rural communities in greater Minnesota are significantly different in terms of clients served and services provided. The metro area has a dense population and is focused on express service and park and ride based transit services. In greater Minnesota, um, the population is much less dense and the majority of the need is the demand response mm -hmm. type, also known as dial ride based services. With these very different constituent bases, very different prime transit services that they provide, it would be difficult to combine them under the single umbrella known as the Greater Minnesota Transit Program. Thank you for the opportunity to make these comments on Senate File 2375. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Nil. Uh, Mr. Dukic, uh, welcome to the committee. Uh, please state your name and uh, with whom you are associated and proceed with your testimony. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members. For the record, my name is John Dukic with the Office of Government Affairs at MnDOT, and I'd like to provide some brief comments on Senate File 2199. Um, you know, we have some some concerns with uh, with the proposal, and I guess to to start, I'd just like to note that the, the Met Council has extensive relationships with gov local governments that provide a transparent process for the development of long range plans and selection of transportation projects. They also have developed the skills and abilities to plan and construct transit in the metro area 
for over 25 years and they understand the complexities and nuances um, with that. Appointing responsibilities to the new board administered by MnDOT would require uh, the agency to hire uh, several new uh, FTEs and acquire a new set of uh, expertise. Uh, the bill assigns the board the task of very detailed transit work such as determining routes and schedules. This is a very specific skill set, um, which the Met Council has years of practice along with the partnerships and relationships um, needed to be successful. In addition, the bill assigns the responsibility of constructing new transit projects to the board. Constructing a new start uh, transit project in partnership with the Federal Transit Administration is very complex uh, with deadlines and multiple submittals. The Met Council is very uh, experienced with this process and has a long time long-standing relationship with the FTA. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, the bill appears to redesignate Met Council's MPO responsibilities to MnDOT in a manner that is inconsistent with federal law, uh, which requires agreement between the governor and local units of government representing at least 75% of the metropolitan population and the largest city. And in this case, that would be Minneapolis. Uh, federal regulations do encourage MPOs to be supported by enabling state laws, but the designation process requires um, a, a different process to follow. So, Mr. Chair, members, that uh, concludes my, my testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dukic. Uh, we will now go to uh, Met Council. Uh, we have uh, uh, Nick Thompson uh, uh, here to testify, and Mr. Shetnan uh, is available to uh, answer any questions that you may have. Uh, but at this time, I will go to uh, Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, for the record, my name is Nick Thompson. I'm the Director of Transportation Services Division at the Met Council. I am gonna comment on both bills. I'll start with Senate File 2375. This bill uh, splits out opt-out functions from the relationship with the council. <coughs> this bill would have the metro area opt-outs receiving federal fundings through the Met Council and state funding, funding through MnDOT. The council would then be required to have a grant agreement with MnDOT in order for the opt-outs to receive their federal funding, which uh, I, we anticipate would add significant uh, structure to and delay to them receiving their funding and add significant oversight complexity uh, for federal funding. The Federal Transit Administration or FTA provides federal funding for the opt-outs to the council and requires the council to provide oversight to ensure that federal laws and regulations are followed. FTA would continue to this practice and expectation of oversight, but the council would have to ensure that MnDOT is providing that oversight also. This bill appears to provide no additional MBES to opt-outs over what they receive currently through the council process. In the current policy, the council provides MBES strictly on block grants on a monthly basis to each of the four opt-outs, and it is a very simple process. MnDOT would have to create a new process and a new system for the subrecipients of the opt-outs for distribution of funding to allocate what's essentially the same amount of money from MVS that they're receiving today. MVS payments would not increase overall for the four opt-out providers, but conceivably MnDOT could change the allocation between the four opt-outs. So the bill could, for example, uh, decrease Maple Grove Transit's funding and increase MBTAs, but overall they would still receive the same amount of money they are receiving today through the state. I'd like to point out that 24% of the Metro Mobility Service occurs in the opt-out communities and is directly tied to the fixed route services that the opt-outs provide. And additionally, there are three major transit ways currently or soon to be in operations in their communities, the red line, orange line, and green line extension. Yet this bill exempts um, METMO and the transit ways from any responsibility by the opt-outs to serve those systems or to contribute any funding. Transferring the opt-outs out of the Met Council would further disconnect them from the regional transit system. It is unclear in this bill how opt-outs would fund their capital needs and their fleet needs in the future. 
This bill appears to be silent on this issue, but if they are moved to under the uh, direction of MnDOT, opt-out communities would likely have to raise their local property tax or find other local sources to match federal fundings uh, for capital needs uh, in, that, are, that they receive. And lastly, all the current opt-out fleet is owned by the council and this bill is silent on how MnDOT would procure or manage the fleet moving forward. For Senate file 2199, uh, this bill, as MnDOT mentioned, is drafted, does not comply with federal law and how MPOs are designated. This designation must be done in agreement with the governor and local governments representing 75% of the urban population, including the largest city, which in our case would be Minneapolis. We anticipate also that the governor of Wisconsin would likely have to approve of the redesignation per federal law and where our MPO boundaries are, but that is undetermined at this time, depending on the census. Last fall, the governor's blue ribbon task force examined the MPO structure of the council and the transit structure in detail. They had a unanimous recommendation of this independent task force that the council remain the MPO for the Twin Cities area. This new board would be put in charge of directing new growth and investment via transportation planning. However, uh, wastewater infrastructure planning and local comprehensive planning would remain with the council. And we anticipate there would be grow, uh, conflicts between these regional system plannings. There are also a few other implications of this bill that I think are important for this committee to understand if it became law. The status of the MPO would be in limbo until the structure is agreed to by the local government, governments and the governors. During this limbo time, it was potential that all federal funding for transportation in the state would be put at risk until an MPO was designated. Also, MnDOT and the newly formed board would become responsible for building guideways in the region starting in 2022. This would directly impact the development and construction of light rail, the Gold Line, Rush Line, and the Riverview Corridor, which are either in or near construction phases of this project. Federal Transit Administration has provided funding grants to the Met Council and not MnDOT for these guideways, and it is unclear what actions the FDA would take for these guideways. Uh, thank you for your time, Mr. Chair and committee members. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Uh, at this point, uh, we can open uh, this up for uh, questions from uh, members. And the first uh, hand that I see up is uh, Senator Johnson Stewart. Thank you, Chair, and thank you everybody who uh, gave us such good information today. I have two very quick questions. The first is from Mr. Winder or Winder. Um, I hope he's still on. Uh, Mr. Hong, Mr. Hong or Huang could also answer this question. One of the slides said that Metro Transit, I'm sorry, Metro Council, um, like Portland manages three different areas, uh, Metro Transit, Metro Mobility and Metro Transit Operations. What is the difference between Metro Transit and Metro Transit Operations? Mr. Winder. All right, thank you very much. Um, a quick, um, you have Metro Transit, which is direct operator of service. Then you have the Metropolitan Council, which actually contracts out service and provides um, fixed route services via a contractor. So they manage that operation. And then you also have the Metropolitan Council that also oversees and manages and contracts out Metro Mobility. So those are the three modes. And as you see on the side of all buses in, um, in the region, um, they all say the vision of the Metropolitan Council for all of those three modes. Got it. Uh, Mr. Winder. Johnson Stewart. Yeah, I'm sorry, I mispronounced your name. You could probably answer my second question too. Um, Nick Thompson mentioned that some percentage of Metro Mobility, well, if you can't answer this, that's okay. Maybe Mr. Thompson can. Some percentage of Metro Mobility is um, actually uh, accomplished out state. And I'm wondering if Nick, or if you could answer that question, what percentage that was. Mr. Weiner. He, he talked, I mean, and, and Nick's proposal, the first time I've heard these numbers, because we don't have any, and that's the thing about lack of coordination. There's no communication between Nick Thompson staff about Metro Mobility and the suburban providers when it comes to the operation, the functions, or anything related to Metro Mobility. We serve on no panels, we serve on no commissions, we have no information exchanges. What we, because of there's no coordination. 
Um, there is no long standing relationship when it comes to that, as we've, I heard a couple of times. But it, I think in his presentation, you can elaborate. He said 24% of metro mobility services are operated within or with operated within our service areas, um, suburban service areas. But it's also important to note that we generate um, over 10% of the motor vehicle sales taxes um, statewide. And we'd like to, and I think it's important for us as we go through this, and we'd love to have a conversation about the motor vehicle sales tax that's operated, that's generated in our suburban communities, how much and how much it costs much mobility and what our, in, in the future, what our subsidies should be to receiving that remaining difference in the future. But this bill does not ask for any additional funding. It just asks for us to take our existing funding over um, to um, greater, if we were fall under Office of Transit in Greater Minnesota, but Nick can elaborate if need be. Now, I see that Mr. Shetton popped up on the screen and uh, Mr. Thompson is on the, the, the stream, screen. Uh, do either of you want to add anything to uh, Johnson, uh, Senator Johnson Stewart's question? Mr. Shetton. Um, oh, well, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, it's good to see everybody this morning. I, I uh, was just popping on. Uh, for the sake of turning on my camera, but I will be happy to um, <laughs> I will be happy to speak to this real briefly. I think um, uh, the point that that Mr. Thompson was making from the council is that if you were to separate uh, the suburban transit providers and move them over to MnDOT, that uh, with doing that there becomes a um, a issue with Metro Mobility, where currently the Met Council uh, provides that service because of their our position as the regional provider here in the in the metropolitan area, but if we're going to separate the suburban transit providers from the regional system and move them to MnDOT, then you call into question a number of, of issues, and one of them being Metro Mobility, because the services that are being provided by the suburban transit providers drive that service that is required under the Americans with Disabilities Act for services for persons with disabilities in those communities. So. We're just kind of making that point. And I also know that uh, Mr. Winder has been making the point about the MVEST that is being uh, driven by the suburban transit providers. But as Mr. Thompson also mentioned, is that the Metropolitan Council pays for all of the capital related to the buses that are operated there. And I don't think that is necessarily being uh, brought up into that overall cost. So I'd just like to point that out to folks is that the council owns those buses. Those are being paid for through a regional property tax that goes across the full uh, region. So I think we should talk about numbers and whole cloth. Thank you, Mr. Shutton. Uh, Mr. Thompson, is there anything else that uh, you wanted to add to this question that has not already been said? Uh, Mr. Chair, and I would just present that 24% number. It represents the share of the cost of Metro mobility that occurs in those 12 communities uh, that represent the opt-outs and that was prevent presented through the Blue Ribbon Committee Panel Task Force. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Uh, uh, Senator Begum, you have your hand up. Uh, yep, one one other thing just to kind of add to this for Senator Johnson Stewart. Um, one of the things we could do, and Mr. Chair, you and I, and, and, and I believe that uh, this is a bipartisan thought too, is we should just remove Metro Mobility out of Met Council, put that over in either HHS, um, HSR, and uh, put it at its own line and forecast it. Um, that would solve a lot of problems, uh, Senator Johnson Stewart. So hopefully we'll have that discussion as well. But you know, um, both um, you know there there are going to be issues no matter what we do. But I think what we can agree upon right now is this isn't working. Um, so uh, I again just want to appreciate Senator Pratt um, uh, in in this proposal uh, for having this discussion, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Begum. Uh, Senator, or uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Shetman, uh, were you trying to get my attention and I missed you? I Well, just very briefly, thank you, Mr. Chair. And to um, Senator Johnson Stewart's uh, question earlier about the different types of services that uh, are provided, uh, Mr. Winter did a nice job of pointing out that we run Metro Mobility, then we also have a contracted services and then Metro Transit services. And I just wanted to point out up and near your, the district that you represent, uh, Maple Grove Transit is a suburban transit provider. However, they are one of the contracted services that Metro Transit provides all of their service. Thank you, Mr. Shetnan. Uh, I do not see any other hands up, so I am going to go to 
the uh, authors of the two bills for some final comments. Uh, and I'll go to uh, Senator Pratt to begin with. Senator Pratt. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to have this discussion. I think, uh, you know, I think uh, uh, the suburban transit uh, providers did a wonderful job of explaining uh, the inherent conflict of interest we have. I appreciate Senator Bigham's bill um, and, the, and the discussion that, that one that I've been pushing that we need to actually reform the Met Council. Uh, we are the only uh, council in the nation that does not have the exact, uh, and, and my bill and Senator Bigham's bill, my Met Council reform bill have exactly the same uh, uh, process for establishing a council with elected members and, and all the other uh, required uh, participants. We don't need, um, we don't, w and we should be conforming with the federal law um, on, on metropolitan MPO governance. Uh, so I think between my bill and Senator Bigham's bill, um, short of real reform on the Met Council, um, this at least removes the, um, uh, the conflicts of interest that we've uh, described, and, and I hope both of these bills will be able to move forward next year. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Senator Bingham. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, one thing I just wanted to point out, too, about the um, federal conformity and legality, um, there is nothing that says we can, couldn't keep um, the Met Council as the MPO and just shove that money over to MnDOT in the way that we see fit um, as a pass-through as well. That is always an option. Um, you know, Mr. Chair, I just appreciate the opportunity and the discussion. Um, I think we all share the same goal of, of again, having an efficient, reliable, um, built-out regional transit system to help people get to jobs, help people get around, um, and really um, improve the viability and vitality of our communities in our metro area. And, um, you know, I think we're, we're saying that, you know, a lot of the, the future routes and, and counties have done a lot with the BRT um, and regular route and express buses. And those are done on roads and bridges and existing roads and bridges and streets. That's been done. It's not met council. And so I think, again, between Senator Pratt's bill, this one, we're going to have a really good conversation and um, hope to have some, some real reform um, in our transit system if we can't get the reform, um, you know, within the Met Council. Um, and, you know, Senator Dibbles made me a believer in um, the uh, reforms that are necessary, and, and, and he's been a good leader on this. Um, for Met Council reform. And so I think we hopefully uh, in the next year we'll take up my bill about the blue ribbon, but that isn't, um, and, and more, but that isn't this committee. But I just appreciate the committee's time and uh, attention to this manner and hope we have some progress here, whether it's in conference committee or next year. Thank you, Senator Bingham. And uh, Senator Dibble has raised his hand. Uh, Senator Dibble, did you have a question on the, either of these two bills? Uh, no, um, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to provide just a quick 60-second uh, response, if I may. Uh, go ahead, please, Senator Dibble. Um, thanks. Um, I appreciate the, uh, the hearing and the conversation. Um, uh, what I, I, I don't know that these are ideas I support necessarily, um, but I do agree um, with both Senator Pratt and Senator Bigham that uh, Met Council reform is needed. Um, you know, I think the reforms that we need are reforms that draw our region more closely together and create more coherence and cooperation and less parochialism and less balkanization. And I don't know that investing um, these services, whether, you know, um, chopping off the opt-outs and sending them to MnDOT or sending the planning uh, functions <clears throat> to MnDOT uh, uh, necessarily achieves that. Um, uh, and, and I certainly don't think exposing the metropolitan areas, transportation and transit interests to uh, decisions made by the entire legislature at all serves the interests of the metropolitan area. I think that's proven time and time again that uh, in issue after issue after issue, whether that's metro parks or uh, re, uh, you know metro regional economic development or transit, um, there's more effort to uh, support uh, 
do damage to the metropolitan area's interest, at least in the GOP budgets that we've just seen in the last two weeks. Um, however, um, Metropol the Metropolitan Council is actually a subdivision, a separate, uh, if you will, local government, uh, similar to counties and cities. And it really should be in a posture of pulling the region together and advocating um, uh, strongly and strenuously for of the people of the metropolitan area, the jurisdictions of the metropolitan area. Um, and it's just not in that position to do that right now because it, it effectively functions as a cabinet level um, executive branch agency. And so its interests are completely assumed into the prerogatives and the procedures and the processes of the executive branch and then subjected to the whims and the, and the uh, debate of the, of the legislature. And so, um, I think we need to start thinking of the region and the Metropolitan Council as exactly what it is, which is, um, you know, similar to a city council or a, or a county, um, you know, really of a posture of advocating for what the, the region needs altogether in a coordinated fashion. And so that, of course, leads me to, you know, some of the proposals that I've introduced um, this year and, and in years past and would hope that, that those ideas would get some airing as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Dibble, and and uh, members. I would say, like Senator Dibble, I don't know whether I support these measures or not, but uh, acknowledge that you know this is an informational hearing where we're simply uh, beginning to engage in a discussion, and and uh, I do uh, want to continue that discussion to see whether uh, you know we can air it out. Uh, maybe it's a good idea. Maybe they're bad ideas. Maybe they can be modified. We don't know at this point. Uh, so I would encourage both Senator Pratt and Senator Bigham to continue your discussions, uh, uh, you know, in the off season. Uh, if you feel that the transportation committee uh, can help uh, with uh, moving your discussions forward, please let us know and just keep us in the loop. Uh, members, with that, uh, we have completed our uh, assignment for today and we are adjourned.